OK, uh, so. Everybody who is watching this, uh, my name is Paula. I've been one of the people responsible for sorting out the items for the exhibition. Um, we are today talking to Simon Poynton, who is uh, a collector in um, Aegis Gator items and has been for a number of years. And we thought it'd be nice to talk to him to find out a bit more about why Edith Gator, uh, what's so special about her work, um, and just have a general chit chat, really. So, Simon, welcome and thank you very much for your time. Welcome and thank you for inviting me in to do this. Um, and hello to everybody that may be watching this at the moment. Hopefully, we'll be able to give you a little bit of info and a little bit of understanding and knowledge of who Edith Gator was and the sorts of things that she did through her middle and later careers. So how long have you been collecting Edith Gator's work? So I started collecting Edith Gator um, predominantly uh, tube line wares between 1933 and 1939. Um, in the mid 80s, um, I used to collect a designer called Charlotte Reed and Frederick Reed and then converted after some accidents onto Edith Gator because it was slightly cheaper and easier to, to purchase to be able to build a collection. Um, the collection then grew into an obsession and a passion and a desire to own as many pieces as I could. Um, and I'm still on the hunt even today, you know, and we're coming up to 40 years down the line. Um, for pieces I haven't got, designs, patterns, shapes I haven't got, um, and I'll continue probably buying until the day I pop my clogs. Uh, hey, there we go. <laughs> so, what makes Edith's work so special? If people understand the designs of all of the Art Deco designers and how they used to produce work, Clarice Cliff used to predominantly do painted work. So her patterns were quite simple and quite easy to do. So it would be a painter would go on and freehand design a painting or a picture onto a jug, a vase, a plate, whatever. When you get into tube line work, the process becomes a lot more difficult. So you'll have a jug or a plate that is then goes to an outliner who would then have a stencil pattern of the pattern put onto the plate jug bars and a tube liner would then put a line of raised paint around the design or pattern it then be fired before it then went back to the paintresses to actually infill all of the design before it went back into firing again. So there's a lot more work and it's a lot more intricate and a lot more delicate in the way it's done. So I, I love tube line wares. So wares that are slightly different to the normal painted works. So when you look at the Art Deco movement here in the UK, the predominant six instigators really of the movement which were quite famous at the time you had Clarice Cliff you had Susie Cooper you had Charlotte Reed Harold Bennett Edith Gator and Molly Hancock well as a lot of people know Edith Gator worked at Hancock's and worked alongside Molly Hancock produced you know a wide range of wares um, so the majority of those artists were did their work mainly as painted works so there was only Charlotte Reed, Edith Gator and Harold Bennett that really de sort of like dipped into the tube line wares all of the rest of the works are all hand painted so they're just designs on. Edith Gator's designs very different to all of the other potters and designers from that instigating group she did a lot of freehand work and some of the patterns and the geometric designs and shapes that she produced, you just fall in love with them. And it's exactly what I did. And it's one of those. There was some of the patterns. There's a pattern called ribbon, um, which is really, really stunning. And she did a matte version of that. And she did a coloured glazed version of the same pattern. Um, 
and it is just amazing to look at it really is and some of the ex some of the works that she did for export only the intricacy of the tube line work on some of the designs are just uh, head and shoulders above anything that Charlotte Reed or Frederick Reed did during that time and yeah she just had this real in-depth passion about doing things and doing things well so that's where my love for Edith Gator came along just looking at the the various designs and patterns and shapes that she produced during the, the late 20s and 30s really. Hmm. And it's, it's quite um interesting that whilst her designs are so beautiful so intricate her yep. work was obviously fantastic and um highly skilled why she's not recognized today um and mentioned in the same breath as the likes of Clarice Cliff and Susie Cooper there's a lot of designers from that period it's the same really as Harold Bennett another one that isn't mentioned sort of like anywhere near where he should be with the sorts of work that he produced during the, the, the late 20s and 30s. Same as Molly Hancock, although she worked for a famous factory, the Hancock factory, and she had there were some wonderful designers there at the Hancock factory, predominantly their probably best designer in George Cartledge. Um, and some of his tube line works from 1910 through to the 20s are exceptional. They're as better quality than any of the um, Moorcrofts, either William or Walter, or that were produced during that time in the ten, teens and 20s. Um, and yeah, it's just amazing stuff. So why certain parts and designers weren't as popular as the Clarice Cliffs, Susie Cooper, Charlotte Reeds? I don't know. I really don't know. Mm. It's, it's it's a real shame uh, we've got um a number of her we've got some of her early work on display but we've also got in the collection quite a number of objects that she produced after the war so oh, yeah. from um up until about i would say the no, about 1960 uh she did quite a lot of work with grays and yeah. we have quite a number of the items that she did at grays uh yeah. In, on display um, I think at the moment they are in Ankerside and in the library yeah. um, and when you look at the designs that she did in the 1930s especially with um, patterns like Rosalind on the plates and yeah. then you look at the items she did for greys not only can you see the difference in obviously fashion and style yeah. but the I think the freedom that she managed to get as she progressed in her career yeah. clearly well, shows through in the later works. She had some really good tutors that she worked alongside. Apart from working at Hancock's, she worked quite closely with the Reed family. So she had a good friendship with Charlotte Reed, Frederick Hurton Reed, Harry Reed, which are Charlotte's brothers, as well as Catherine and Dolly. But she worked quite a bit under dad, Frederick Albert, Alfred Reed. Um, and she actually took over as head of pottery and design for the Royal Cauldron Factory when Frederick Reed passed away in 1933. So she'd had a good grounding because the Reed family are probably the greatest pots and designers this country has ever had. Um, because you also go back in history with the Reed family. It's not just Frederick Alf Alf Alfred Reed. You've got Lewis Reed. You've got George Wallace Cross Reed. You've got George Wallace Cross Senior. And the whole family goes all the way back to the late 1700s. And the Reed family is still going today. Um, after Charlotte Reed, you had Albert Reed that worked for Paul Pottery until 1982. And you've got Sue Reed, who's a free love potter and designer in the West Country currently. So the Reed family go back generations. Um, and Frederick Reed worked for some of the best companies in 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 the world he worked at serve he worked at minton's you know brown westhead and more he did lots of paints of paint work at serve and for minton's um and he was an exceptionally exceptionally good potter and designer um and probably some of his greatest works he did for charles wildman between 1890 and 1910 when he created and designed the intarsio range for charles wildman um and some of the 
sort of like patterns and designs that Edith used and created come from working alongside some of those other parts and designers and how they worked and how they put things into sort of like into practice and into into the designs and parts themselves you know she Edith Gator when she took over as head of pottery and design in 1933 at Royal Colton at that time Frederick Reed was actually looking at reinstigating another of the potteries that he used to own which was Wardle Pottery and he was looking at bringing out a range of wares called Wardle Artware which Edith had quite a bit of work helping design and sort those out and if you actually look at some of the tube line designs for Royal Cordon and then look at the work that was done for the Wardle Art Pottery it just screams Edith Gator the shape of the flowers the leaves the way they were done it's all 100% Edith Gator um, and it's yeah if to see the wall art range is is amazing it's mind-blowing it really is really high brightly colored works it's fabulous and then yeah she took over head of pottery and design and started producing her own work wares for royal Colton. Um, and a lot of those wares were then sold via um george jones so and there's works some of her works come out through george jones through the sort of like mid to late 30s so do you have a favorite piece amongst your collections um there's a lot of designs that i actually love yeah. from the works that she did herself for royal Colton. some of the export wares are probably my favorite um, and I've got two pieces that were made for the North American market, which you can't get here in the UK um, unless someone's brought it over or brought it back to the UK. Um, but they're exceptionally, exceptionally good. And the the fine detailed work on the tube line in is I haven't seen another pottery designer from that period that's done anything better at any factory. OK, I'm going to ask you a really difficult. Uh, I think I know the answer to this. If you lined all of the female ceramicists from the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Who was the best? <laughs> I'm, right. Clarice Cliff is recognised as the best pottery and designer from from the 20s, 30s. I actually don't like her work. Some of the bits are OK, some of the bits are, uh, yeah, just normal. Um, Charlotte Reed, I like the work of Charlotte Reed. I like really like the work of Frederick Hurton Reed, her older brother. Um, but yeah, if you actually look at the style, design and look, there is yeah, Edith Gator is head and shoulders over all of them, I'm afraid. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> Somehow I, mean, I got, knew you were going to say that. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a difficult one, you know. Yeah, I mean, I have an Art Deco shop. Um, in that shop, I have pieces by Susie Cooper. I've got pieces by Clarice Cliff. I've got lots of pieces by the Reed family, Charlotte, Frederick Hurton, Harry, um, Frederick Alfred. I've got bits by Molly Hancock here in the shop. So all of the main protagonists for the Art Deco movement in the late 20s, 30s, I've got pieces by all of those. Um, and yeah, I would have, well, I've got a house full of Edith Gator. So <laughs> it's it's one of those. I love Edith Gator's work. It is really, really good. OK, and as a final note for people who are watching this um and they were interested in finding out more about mm -hmm. Edith Gator or perhaps any of the female ceramicists yeah. from that period what piece of advice would you give them knowledge is power you know as I say to anyone that comes into the shop or anyone that I've been sort of like has bought from me at fairs I am a knowledge and fountain of information I am as happy selling bits as I am talking to people about the potters, designers, the patterns, the factories, how things are supposed to look and what the period was about. You know, if people understand what the period is about, when you actually see things, you actually see 
a totally different side. When you go to an antique fair or an antique shop, you generally see one or two bits of Art Deco pottery or ceramics. Um, and it might look OK until you actually get to somewhere where there is hundreds of pieces and you actually see the different designs, the different styles, the different ways things are done. Um, yeah, you don't really get the feel for it. You don't you can miss the whole era, to be honest, you know, having things. It's not, I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't want everyone to go out and start becoming mass collectors of, of Art Deco pottery. But until you actually see it all on display and you actually see what different companies produced and how they produced works and the different styles just to show the era of what it was about and that decadent period, which it really was, you know, it was that. You know, Art Deco followed on from the Art Nouveau period and the transition period from the Art Nouveau, sort of like from 1910 through to the 1930s. And you see the transition from the darker colours of the Art Nouveau period moving through. And you, you can see as you go through the colours starting to lighten until you hit the 30s. And all of a sudden there's just this explosion of colour and design and, and shape that you haven't really seen. Um, in previous years and it's you know it's trying to have an idea of what things are like um, as you're probably aware I've got a Facebook page which has I've got a native gate a Facebook page and I've got a few bits on there I've probably got about 30 40 50 pieces um, on the Facebook page which people are more than happy or I'm more than happy if they want to log into the Facebook page just to see some of the designs and shapes um, and it will give people a little bit of an idea of what Edith Skater's work was about. Um, and then, thankfully, we've got someone that's putting on an exhibition to highlight some some of her personal works and some of the works that she's done. And there's some of the works there that even I've not seen. And I've seen quite a bit of the stuff she's got. And I will be making my way down to the exhibition to see it, whether it's in one building or four buildings. I will get <laughs> around to all of them um, just to see some of the works that I've not seen before. So, you know, hopefully this exhibition is going to highlight Edith and what Edith was about and how her brain worked in regards to design and how she felt the period should be and how the period should look, um, which was what most of the potters and designers, they had their own vision of what they thought the Art Deco period should be and how it should be taken. You know, people look at it at the time, a lot of the parents were pretty much against it, same as most of the major potteries were pretty much against the Art Deco and the new style and new designs through the 20s. You know, most of the major companies poo-pooed it and they really weren't that interested. Until the bug kicked off, really, then you found a lot of the companies, you know, and for probably the biggest instigator there, if you look at the Myatt factory, uh, Maya Pottery produced works through from the 1800s through into the 20s and they did very much like Hancock's, a lot of tea sets, a lot of dinner services and a lot of stencil patterns and variants on that. But 1933, they caught the bug and all of a sudden they started producing their own range of hand painted geometric shaped jugs, vases. And when you see that on mass, it's, yeah, quite breathtaking. And it makes Clarice Cliff's work look very, very mundane, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, Simon, I'd like to say thank you so much for your time You're today. Um, it's been wonderful talking to you about all things ceramic. Uh, Lara, I'd like to thank you for recording, facilitating this for us today. Um, and to everybody who may be watching this, please do come along to the various locations for the exhibition. And Simon, of course, you are most welcome anytime. I will. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right. Take care.